Okay, so we're here with our uh, monthly Google Plus Microbiology Journal Club Hangout. And today we'll be talking about um, this excellent paper that appeared recently in eLife. And it's from Peter Lind, Andrew Farr, and Paul Rainey. And they will be uh, they're discussing this great experimental system with Pseudomonas fluorescens. And they're looking at some really cool questions, some fundamentally important questions about um, evolutionary pathways and about parallel genetic evolution. And so I think this is, this is something I'm interested in. And so I'm really excited to see this. And I'm excited to see uh, a paper that really, I think, they, I think they've done an excellent job kind of presenting the big points of their, of their research in, a, in what I felt to be an accessible way. Hopefully you guys did too. Um, but we will go ahead and talk about that. And it looks like we might have gotten Brian, although I can't see him, but he's up there in a little panel spot. So maybe we'll maybe we'll hear from maybe we'll hear from him. Um, but to start with, we'll do introductions. My name is Laura Williams, and I need to put my little uh, where's my little toolbox? I gotta pop myself up there. So I am um, currently a uh, assistant professor at um, Providence College, which the reason I'm Saying that slowly is because I'm typing it right now so that it'll pop up. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> That's me. Um, I am uh, started as an assistant professor at Providence College on January 1st, so I'm staggering towards the end of my first semester, which might be why I look like drawn and haggard right now. <laughs> Very tired. Don't but, fish um, for compliments. Sorry. Don't fish for compliments. <laughs> no, I don't think there's any to be had at this stage. Um, uh, but I'm really glad that we're doing this. Um, we, we're doing this in April because this is. I really look forward to the Journal Club, and so I'm excited about talking about this paper because we're thinking about uh, genome evolution in our lab here. So this is a good thing for us to be thinking about for the research we do here at PC. So then I'll turn it over to Mark because he's right next to me in the little panels down below. Sure, I, I'm Mark Martin, an associate professor, an old associate professor at the University of Puget Sound in, in lovely Tacoma, Washington, and I am really excited to be talking about this paper because I've used aspects of it in a teaching lab, and it's fabulous for instructors. It's absolutely a great, great system, and I particularly like the long period of time that Paul Rainey has spent investigating it over many years and really doing a great job with it. It's a wonderful exercise for students of all ages. Excellent. That's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing, because I have no direct experience with the system, so I'm really looking forward to hearing how you guys have, have what you've seen with it in your lab. Um, Karen, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. Um, my name is Karen. Um, I'm a... Wait, does, is that working? Yes, Because I'm can actually hear you. not popping up. Okay, that's fine. Um, I'm a PhD student in uh, from in Vancouver um, from Simon Fraser University and uh, I study a potential bioterrorist bacteria called Francella tularensis that I look at the different proteins that it uses to uh, infect people and to um, infect cells and uh, but I also really enjoyed the paper actually for um, the fact that it was really easy to read like, um, just my initial impression of it I really enjoyed the smoothness of the reading. Like, I didn't feel that it was choppy or um, disconjointed at all. So, um, I'm also looking forward to discussing and listening to see what y you guys have to say about it. It certainly wasn't a wrinkled paper. <laughs> That's true. No, I agree with you. I think it was uh, wonderfully written, which is always such a joy to read a, a paper that has a compelling research question, but it's written in a way that you can, you don't have to come into it already kind of guessing, like, what are the 18 things that they didn't say that I should know already? Uh, so that's good. Um, it looks like we've got a fourth person, although we haven't heard from him yet, so I don't know if he's having technical difficulties. Brian, are you there? He's got a little spot down there at the bottom, but maybe we will um, feel free. Brian, if you can hear us but you cannot be heard yourself, feel free to tweet at one of us, and we will try to help you fix that. Oh. There, we, now we see him. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Are you with us? Oh, yes, you are. Great. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? We were just kind of doing a little bit of introduction. Sure. I'm Brian Kavicko. I'm at the um, uh, Department of Energy Plant Research Library at Michigan State University. I'm going to be starting an assistant professorship over the summer at University of Georgia. Oh, you're going to UGA. I did my PhD at UGA. No kidding. 
Oh, that's awesome. In the micro department? I did indeed, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm Is sorry, I don't want to make people motion sick, so if you want to walk away, you know, click away from me, that's fine. i got to walk here. Okay, okay, that's no problem. Well, I'm very excited for you that you're joining. Are you joining the micro department at UDA? No, the plant pathology department. The plant pathology doing, department. Okay. Yeah, heavy microbiology, though. So. Yes, definitely. Oh, that's excellent. Well, I, I, you'll really like Athens, I think. I think many people are, yeah, are very fond of it. So. I'm sure it's going to be a stressful period. Well, yes, I can tell you. from <laughs> personal experience. Even though I'm not an R1, I can just say yes, that's true. <laughs> but um, but excellent. That's really congratulations. That's really good Thank news. You. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and get into the paper, and um, I put the link up on um, the WordPress site, so if there's people who are potentially watching who would like to join us, we certainly have space, so feel free to hop in. We um, welcome people to, to join us with their thoughts. Okay. This paper is um, gets into, and I thought what I would do is very briefly kind of talk about the experimental system, because it is one that I had heard of but was not terrifically familiar with. But it's been um, studied by a, a number of labs that are doing some great work with it in terms of what it can tell us about mutation, evolution, some of these very important fundamental questions. And so this, this experimental system uses a bacterium called Pseudomonas fluorescens. And specifically, the ancestral geno genotype of this particular Pseudomonas fluorescens strain, when you put it into a static liquid culture, it will differentiate into what I think are three morphs is what is typically observed. There's the smooth morph, which kind of colonizes the liquid column of the culture. And again, we're talking about a static one, so this is when it's not being shaken. So you just kind of let it sit, and it can stratify into these uh, niches. And so you have, and Mark, feel free to correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong. But um, I think you have the smooth morph that colonizes the liquid column. You have, a, I think it's a fuzzy morph that will colonize at the bottom, which I don't really know anything about. And then the focus of this paper is something called the wrinkly spreader morph, which will colonize the air-liquid interface. And so this is all about, uh, the selective pressure here is the competition for oxygen, essentially. So can you get access to oxygen since it's not being shaken and aerated? Um, and so the wrinkly spreader morph will reproducibly occur if you do these experiments. If you start with Pseudomonas fluorescence of this particular genotype, you will reproducibly get wrinkly spreader morphs appearing. And I found a paper that talked about kind of the background of this, and they said it'll it'll account for about 30% of the population within five days. Yep. Does, it, does that sound about right to you, Mark? It does. Okay. Remember the original paper, Travisano and Rainey, about this was a fabulous paper. It's in nature. It's very short. You take one look at that plate with the different morphs on it, and you think, if I had seen that, I would have just thrown it into the autoclave waste. But the fact is, really is this adaptive radiation, and Paul Rainey's group has continued to work on it for many years and teased out all the details. It's a fabulous system. Excellent. Brian, do you have any experience with this system specifically? I, I, I don't necessarily know. Oh, you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> office and waiting for 1970s fax machine, well, 1970s technology to give me a fax, tell me if it's sent or not. Um, I've worked with other fluorescent strains before, not SB25. Okay. SB25 is interesting in that I believe it, it gets used as a, protect, as a crop protective fluorescence. Oh, I don't know. Is that true? Yeah. It's, it's a, it was an isolated... Phenomenon, Burkholderia pseudomallei. Um, which also has a tendency to throw a lot of strange colony morphs, and that seems to be based on iron restriction. Okay. Uh, but not specifically SB25 or wrinkly spreaders. Okay, so uh, we, you cut out just a little bit. Uh, did you say that you worked with Burkhold area that will also do this differentiation into, into morphs? Yeah, it seems to, though we've never really figured out why. I mean, Burkhold area is sort of interesting in that it always looks like it's contaminated because it throws so many different colony morphs. But if you do subject it to iron restriction, it does seem to switch from one morph to the other. And we never really looked at that. Okay. Can, can I throw something in here? If, if you go back to historical stuff, and you'll get Bergernik, if I'm saying that correctly, his old notebooks, many, many microbes seem to, seem to throw off different morphs. And what folks used to do is they got rid of the variable ones. 
Right. I mean, if you look at a, at a regular clinical isolate of serratia marcescens, yes, I'm supposed to call it serratia. Anyway. <laughs> Are you really? I did not know that. I've always called it serratia. Me too, until a German said no. But that's oh. okay. I say phage too, so we're, 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 we're batting 100 on that. Anyway, what I meant to say about this is that you look at it, both pigment production and bioluminescence, and they showed a lot of variation. I can show you photographs I've taken of sectored colonies and all these different things coming off. The advantage in both the Burkholz area business that Brian talked about and certainly SWB25 or SMB25, anyway, this pseudomonas strain, is that you have some kind of phenotype to start looking in relationship to the environment with. I don't know what the advantage would be lack of pigmentation or having pigmentation, bioluminescence or none. I do know this business of the mat is important, the business of iron sequestering and the other situations. That makes it a really, really powerful tool. Mm -hmm. In addition, you can get mat cheaters with this. Mat cheaters? Sorry? You will get mat cheaters. You'll get switches back that take advantage of the cellulose fibers and eventually sink it. And that's a fabulous thing to show students. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I don't think this paper got into the, 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 the cheater phenomenon. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and that is interesting in a in a purely asexual organism too. I mean, I guess they're not purely asexual because they're differentiating. They carry different genotypes. So, like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the genes are the same, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and, they can, and they can recombine, so they've yeah. got that as an option too for uh, in terms of generating variability. But I don't I think, think that with these time scales, I'm not sure how much of a role that's playing. I wonder how common, in the case of the of the WS phenotype, it's obviously based on modifying uh, sort of the secondary signaling pathways. So you, you get the phenotype you want, but you pick up a lot of other phenotypes at the same time. Since there are so many different ways to create these sort of on-off lifestyle choices, you, you see, the, for instance, why does the colony perform a wrinkly spreader on a plate? Uh, that has nothing to do specifically with its lifestyle choice. It's, it's a consequence of this particular selective pressure. Right. So I just wonder how many of these colony morphs actually boil down to a uh, cyclic DIGMP effect. Yeah, yeah. I so I mean, it, I go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. All I was going to say is the other thing is when I've had students do this just for jollies, you know, set a static culture up from the smooth morph and look for wrinkly spreaders in the mat, you don't get just one type of wrinkly spreader. You get a lot of variation. We've gotten some huge wrinkly spreaders. These are single colonies that grow out in almost tentacular stop. Almost in tentacular forms, and then you'll even get over at one edge of the arm something that reverts back to the smooth morph. And I put up a Twitter picture of that a while back, which I can dig up if you'd like to see it. Yeah, sure, please. If you want to post it to the hash repost it to the hashtag for the journal club, that'd be great. Yeah, a student um, might found that. Yeah. So has anyone uh, does it will it revert if you take a WS phenotype and you subject it to aeration? I mean, yeah. how common is it? And do you get specific revertance of those original <laughs> mutations, or do you get new compensating mutations? Well, that's that's a Paul Rainey question. You absolutely can get reversion. <laughs> If you look at the original uh, Travisano and Rainey paper, there's like a, a wonderful, I'm going to call it a fate map. And I was looking at that thinking, how on earth would you measure that? But they made a, an awfully good stab at it. And this is nature from the late 90s. <laughs> I'm going to have to find that paper. Can you yeah. post the original paper too? Just for fun, you said it's short. I should take a look at it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, um, we'll add that to the, the Travis Hunter and, and Rainey paper. We'll add that to the website as a background thing. I might make a little note to do that for sure. Um, yeah, so, so we've kind of touched on a little bit of the really amazing aspects of this system for answering some of these evolutionary questions. And what I thought I would do to kind of um, launch us into the big ideas of this is they did such a fabulous job walking through what are the major theoretical ideas that they're addressing, which I do think is sometimes one of the harder things to get across in a, in a manuscript, in a paper. And they've just done that, I think, wonderfully. So I'm not, I'm going to read from them because I don't think I could do hardly as well to try to uh, paraphrase it. But so, there's, so they're talking about explanations for parallel evolution and trying to kind of understand the various underlying rules. And so they give these scenarios, which I think sets up really well why they've chosen this system. So they're saying, you know, if you think about it, 
if evolution proceeds via a single route because there is no other, then there is no reason to suppose that evolution is anything other than idiosyncratic. So they've kind of, here's one thing where you get evolution proceeding along one route. It is the only route available, so okay, that's explained. So then they say, should evolution proceed along a single pathway when multiple are available, and yet the fitness of the phenotype from the common path is superior, then there is no dilemma to solve. I've left out some of their nice language about the pleasure of discovery, but, um, but so that also, like, that logically makes sense as well. So if you have a single pathway and there's a, there's a significant fitness advantage, also that's somewhat easily explained. But what they're seeking to address is to say, if evolution proceeds along a single pathway, and yet that pathway is just one of a number of possible routes to a range of phenotypes with equivalent fitness, so they're kind of setting up the parameters for, for the theoretical idea they're addressing, then determining the underlying causes becomes a matter of interest. So I like that they, I mean, in one paragraph, they've done such a great job of saying, here is this major question that we want to address, which is parallel evolution. You know, you can get, you, there, there may be multiple pathways to a particular phenotype. Why are some favored above others? So their aim here is to kind of start to understand some of the constraints. Um, with the wrinkly spreader pseudomonas fluorescence system, the work that's been done previously has shown that there were three major mutational pathways that are used um, reproducibly to get to a wrinkly spreader morph. So when other people have done these experiments with these static cultures, they found that there were kind of three pathways, all of which, as Brian has pointed out, deal with um, cyclic DIGMP um, and signaling with the eventual purpose or the, the eventual outcome, purpose is the wrong word, the eventual outcome of having um, overproduction of cellulose. Um, so but what they wanted to know is, well, how do we know that these three are the only pathways available? So what if there are other pathways because there's something like 39 of these, um, I think they've mentioned that somewhere. There's a great figure that kind of walks, figure two kind of walks through the mechanism behind getting to a wrinkly spreader morph. And they mention that there are um, these diguanolate cyclase genes. And I think there are 39 of them in total. And the three mutational pathways that have previously been identified uh, uh, deal with three of them. And so they're like, but there's 36 more. So maybe those pathways involving those other 36 could lead to a wrinkly spreader morph. Let's find it, that out, and let's figure out what are the constraints that previous experiments are limiting us to the, these three pathways. Um, this is a, such a great question to address because I know that when I'm looking at, when the, in my postdoc, when I did bacterial genome evolution of endosymbionts, I mean, I just had a paper come out in Pure J where it's all about parallel evolution. So you're finding losses of similar genes, you're finding, you know, in divergent species. So p parallel evolution is something that is under, a lot of, of bacteria are, are undergoing this. And so this is a great way to start to figure out what's going on and what are the actual mechanistic processes underlying this. That was a lot of me talking about how excited I am about this paper. Um, so maybe what we'll start with is kind of thinking a little bit about what, what they were how they went about trying to figure out what other three pathways are available. Um, so I might put Karen on the spot. <laughs> can I put Karen on the spot? Yeah, you can. Um, so do you want to just just mention really briefly like what their strategy was for trying to figure out what alternative pathways were available? Well, I will try to explain it in the best way that I possibly can <laughs> because um, I actually have questions about this as well. Oh, well, then so that's perfect. As, so we'll talk about it then. Um, so as far as I understand, um, they set up uh, different microcosms. Does that mean like different nutrient conditions? And then, no, that's not it. Okay. What is it, Mark? Microcosms, I got to tell you, they're like a little beaker. Okay. And you put a small amount of the media in it and you inoculate it. And that's all they mean by it. Yeah, it's oh. a fancy word for for lots of like in their picture here. They've got lots of like yeah, these little. Oh, okay. I I always I thought like a microcosm was a specific different nutrient condition or something. Okay, so that's not it. No, and, but but you can alter you can alter the microcosms in different ways to see how frequently this effect happens, which is what's so cool about it. 
So like if you do the same volume and you put a lot more air in it or you restrict the air, you can alter the frequency with which you see these things. That's what yeah. makes it so cool. In this case though, they were looking for uh, as they were looking for replicates, right? So yes. they had their their two hundred what they hoped to be almost exact replicates. Okay, so then in that case they set up two two hundred uh, set two hundred sets of glass conditions, but um, they're just the same two hundred replicates. I'm sorry, um, and then they inoculated them with the smooth uh, mutant that they isolated with the three negative regulator mutants, and those um, so they use those to kind of deter to create a genetic background that would favor mutation in a different in a different path because from the previous paper they identified that these mutations were are all all of the mutations that they identified eventually resulted in these mutations so using this they were hoping to identify different paths of evolution and then after growing them they found um, they found they had they isolated specific mutants then used um, transposons a transposon screen so then that just means that they inserted the transposon um, and then looked for suppressors which means that the phenotype that they were looking for was suppressed so then from identifying the location of the transposon they could identify the location of the mutation it, is that correct yeah okay yeah, I think you've got you've got it so they yeah. so they uh, because somebody had done all this work exactly like you said, somebody had done a bunch of work to identify the three loci that had reproducibly been identified previously. And so this group said, well, we want to know what else could potentially lead to this morph. So what we're going to do is we're going to knock out those three loci. So they are not, they are no longer an available evolutionary pathway to get to the wrinkly spreader morph. And then we're going to see, like, out of our 200, are we going to get wrinkly spreaders? And then if we do, how do they get there? Um, so yeah, that's that's, and I think that's really that's really neat. Um, and so they they found that out of the 200, only 91 generated wrinkly spreader morphs, which I thought was interesting because they make a point to say if you start with the ancestral genotype in which those three common pathways are available, all all 200, you know, you would expect all of these replicates to end up with the wrinkly spreader morph. So they've got, I mean, their initial data that they report, the 91 out of 200, suggests that there are probably other mutational pathways, but they're not as, I don't know if successful is necessarily the right word, but they're certainly not as frequently traveled um, as, the, as the three common pathways that have been identified. Did they say what peak, uh, peak bacterial density was, how many individuals were present in each microcosm approximately? Oh, that's interesting. I did not note that if they did. Did you well, see they that? make mention of trying to figure that out. Numbers of generations, that kind of thing. Sure. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't actually know uh, how easy it is to measure growth rate in a static mm. culture. Right. Yeah. We do that in in things that are actively mixing. So, as I recall, what they do, and I can't pull the data out in my head, but as I recall, they figure out the input cells and then measure the output cells, and then determine a number of generations that be part of that. Okay. Just based on just dilution culture, we had, yes. we started with this many, we ended with this many. Yeah. And ignoring death and everything else. Yeah, and, and, and additionally, I would argue it's harder than it sounds because you get a lot of clumping, um, and you, you know you heard a little bit about the fuzzy morph that that Laura talked about, and that that tends not to resuspend terribly well in my experience. And by the way, if anyone who works with this system is hearing me, I am by no means an expert. I'm just a dabbler, but I've worked with students. Vaughn, if you're hearing this, thank you so much for the strains. <laughs> oh, do we have to shout out to Vaughn Cooper? Did he give you your strain? Oh, yeah, shout out, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> dumb and dumb. Micro, right? There it is. <laughs> there you go. Um, he just announced on Twitter that he's moving. So I, I said, know. That would be cool. And, you know, if you look at his, and I believe it's called evolvingstem.org, that's the website that he came up with trying to get this system into high schools. And it's it's a very like a perfect system for teaching. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, also, it's, it's not perfect, I have to throw in, because, you know, if you read how he does it, he uses these little these little plastic beads to select for things that form biofilms, for example. 
and, and they're hard to get, as, yeah. as I discovered. And if students aren't used to working with microbes, it's a challenge. So I think what he does is he sends people into the schools. But any of us could develop this. And I know I've tried a few things with, with my classes. And I'm going to continue to do so. Oh, that's excellent. So we should, we should, we'll, we'll add that to the website. And, uh, you know, so it's evolvingstem.org? I believe so. I'll, I'll check on that in a second. And, Laura, I just sent you images and two links to papers. Ah, fantastic. Thank you. So check the website if you're watching this because we're going to be adding some things to it. I will go and make sure it's evolving STEM right now. Okay. Well, that's great. Yeah. Um, so the, the kind of the outcome of this is that they've got 91 of their 200 replicates that uh, developed, a, evolved a wrinkly spreader morph. So and that's... They, go sorry. ahead, Karen. I was just going to say that 91 out of 200 is actually quite a bit. Like, to, that's almost 50% of regenerating the, the phenotype. Yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, there's, they're, they're, I wonder what they expected. <laughs> I wonder if they had an expectation going into it. Um, and well, well keep, keep in mind, Laura, what I was going to say is what they're looking for overproduction of, of cellulose. Right. Okay. Acetylated coast. There, 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 there's lots of different ways to skin a cat, lots of different ways to make a polymer, sure. So, you know, they're wondering if there are other ways, and, and all those cryptic genes that it's regulators that could be good for that is a fascinating subject, and that's why I posted the very controversial Barry Hall um, review on evolved beta-galactosidase. Turns out there are many cryptic genes by a few mutations can kind of replace one that's missing. So I'm sure they expected to see this, and I, I'm really pleased to see um, how quickly it kind of um, had a workaround genetically. Mm. That shows how strong that selection is. Well, and that's one of the things that I thought was so neat about this is that um, it's a really good reminder to, and I think this is a this is potentially something that's tough to get across to students. The idea that that mutations are arising in these populations all the time, mm -hmm. and then there's then there's the selective pressure that um, either fixes a mutation in a population or the mutation is lost because it, it, the selective coefficient is, is, you know, does not give it an advantage. Um, and I think it's good to always be able to have some things to point to so that people can have an illustration of the fact that, you know, yep, in a population, especially if you've got 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th cells, you're going to get these mutations arising and there's selection, you know, in this case for the wrinkly spreader, it's the depletion of oxygen is imposing a condition that's going to then kind of change the frequency of these of these mutations in the population. Um, so they, they start to then tease out the different types of mutations that are in these 91. And, and I thought it was interesting that they noted that the, the I'm not going to say vast majority because this phrase is overused, um, <laughs> a lot of them, 86 out of the 91 are single mutations. So there's so in 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 a you know 86 of these it was a, a single mutation pathway so there was one step that got them to a wrinkly spreader morph which I thought was really interesting and then they had a, the the leftovers the five other ones had either double or or one triple mutation so yeah. what I couldn't tell from the I don't want to skip too far ahead but what I couldn't quite tell with the double and triple mutations was did they were they able to determine the sequence of mutations? I, it didn't strike me that they that they necessarily did. Um, not to not to skip really far ahead to the double and triple mutations, but they, those were essentially they said um, early frame shift mutations are stop codons, suggesting that they're loss of function. So I was kind of wondering if maybe the double and triple mutations was was it. One, was it one mutation that affected the, the loss of function and then the others were just accumulated mutations because it's no longer a functional piece of DNA? I didn't quite get that. Would you be able to know, though? I mean, that's when, what I'm not sure. They, they, did a, they did reconstruct these mutations um, later in the paper, but I had, I had to admit I had a little trouble following... As they, they talked about them as individual or combination, and I got, I got a little bit lost partially because I was trying to read it too fast, I think, uh, of, of figuring out um, 
I don't I don't think that they necessarily tested the sequence. That was one of the things that I thought was interesting about this hand. I mean, it is just a handful where they had multiple mutations. But I had kind of wondered, oh, I wonder if they know the sequence of these. I'm kind of a microbial old fogey. And, and one of the things that I really worry about are secondary and tertiary. I don't mean double and triple mutations, but extra genic changes and how to find them easily. And this is one of the things that Rich Lensky has always tried to, to, to work with. And that's why I know that Von Cooper has said to me privately, if you get really weird things, you know, they'll do a whole genome sequence just in case there are things unexpected. Okay. One of the problems with dealing with a pathway you think you're sure of is, and, and this is where I guess I'm a vitalist, nature is more clever than we are. And, 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 and I've over and over again seen people kind of second guess bacterial philosophy, as it were. And you just can't do it. I mean, think about the selection here. This is fascinating stuff. And you're asking it to do something and looking at the end product. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I think whole, whole genome sequencing will answer that question if there are other unusual things taking place. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, how many different, um, I can never say it correctly, the guanylate cyclase analogs, how many different uh, homologs of them exist? I mean, there's like dozens and dozens, and if they can, and, and a, a significant number can be recruited. And that's just based on what you think might happen. Yeah. Right? And I think did they, they did make some mention of gain-of-function mutations, which they did not, I mean, they, they, their argument, understandably, is that your loss-of-function mutations are going to be more frequent than your gain-of-function. Sure, sure. Um, but your point, your point remains that if you, because they did this over six days, um, but if you did this for longer, you, oh, yeah. right, like, could, would you end up with a, outside of the 39 that are identified, would you end up with something that is homologous yeah. that would eventually be able to play some kind of a role? And I would also argue that, you know, I would be very interested to look at the mats rather mm -hmm. than plate things out and look for morphology mutants. They're doing it because they can. That's why they're doing it, and it's a good system. But I wonder about the relationship between the two. We may actually be finding different things that way. Oh, I and see. I, yeah. I, I want to draw your attention, and I'll get this link and put it up for you. Doug Bartlett at Scripps Institution of Oceanography many years ago was working with an organism called Pseudomonas atlantica. Now it's Pseudoaltramonas. You know how they change the names. Yeah. Anyway, it turns out that there's an EPS, exopolysaccharide uh, aspect, and that clings to surfaces, but it also throws off morphs that don't. So that's the way it can disperse. What's responsible is an insertion element that hops perfectly in and out every few hundred generations. Yeah, I'm smiling about that because um, Anna Carls at uh, UGA, um, so here you go, Brian, <laughs> one of your future mm -hmm. colleagues, um, she, worked on, she worked on that too. So yeah. I, I always, every day when I would walk into work, I would always, almost always pass the poster that showed the little thing hopping in and hopping out. One of them was smiley and one of them was not smiley. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, she was kind enough to send me, you know, some strains and, and primer suggestions to have students work on that. And I like to use that as an example of a very specific genetic rearrangement that gives rise to that kind of phenotypic difference that is harnessed to driving phenotypic changes under natural selection, surfaces versus more planktonically. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I, I think about a lot with this system. There's a similar observation that's been made in plant pathogens where uh, an avirulence gene pops in and out on an ectopic plasmid based on whether or not the appropriate plant host can recognize it or not. Yeah. So, same idea. Um, and it's it's very strange. It's like it's holding on to the genetic potential. So it is genetically changing in a way that's inheritable, but then it can revert. Uh, I, I don't know if there's anything like that in eukaryotes. Well, it, it makes me say something that's really heretical that, you know, we think we understand selection but we understand the human perspective on selection. Or even and, just the sexual perspective yeah, on selection. Right. And so the, 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 the point of view, I hate anthropomorphizing, but maybe I'm micropomorphizing myself. <laughs> um, right? I mean, it's the philosophy of it. We think we understand the selective pressure on a microbe, and it, we may let our own shadow fall across it. Mm, that's very poetic. No, I like that. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, I like that. Liberal Arts College. Yeah, well, hey, that's me too. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so 
it's, it's clear that this is something that's kind of going on in a lot of different systems, which I, which is, as I think I've, I'm repeating myself now, but is one of the reasons why I think this is such a great paper to start teasing up these things out. Um, I did, I, I skipped ahead a little bit by mentioning the multiple mutations, but I did want to say that they start to kind of uh, break down what the different categories are. So I'll just, this is the poor man's like screenshot. <laughs> Um, so they've got kind of different categories where they're looking at. So these three genes here are the pathways that they had previously identified. And then what they're doing is they're kind of now looking at what else did they find. Um, and mine's not in color, unfortunately. But I thought, as I circled, I thought this one was really interesting. So of, of the mutations that they found, this was the one that had the most frequent. And it was um, energetic. So it's this energetic, um, what they think to be a negative, negative regulator. Um, so I, I'm guessing that one of the outcomes of this paper is that they're going to focus strongly on that particular gene. Um, because from what I can tell, since it doesn't have, it's just got a locus tag, it looks like perhaps it's not annotated yet with a, with a known function. Um, so I would say that that would be an outcome of this, is that there's someone currently working hard on, on that gene in particular, trying to figure out what it does. And, and, um, Ooh, studying an unknown gene, gene of unknown function. Do we do that? Do what? <laughs> Do we study genes of unknown functions? I, I wish we did more of it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that, that, that question right there is one that I, because I, as I've mentioned, I've worked on um, bacterial endosymbionts which have, which have extraordinarily reduced genomes. I mean, these are, these are, you know, smaller than the size of a large plasmid in some other things, like 700 kilobases. And you'll still get genes that have come up with an annotation of, like, hypothetical protein, no known function. Yeah. You're like, well, it's got to be doing something, because there's no oh. way that these endosymbionts would have kept it for this long while they're jettisoning other things if it didn't do anything. So um, if one of the outcomes of this is that we start to kind of annotate more genes, that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. No, you're absolutely right. And I was teasing mostly. It oh, seems yeah. like there's definitely a tendency to go with, well, this looks like a protease, so we'll study that. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. That was the, the, the vehemence of my response was because I'm absolutely on board with that idea. Mm. Is that we, there's a lot out there that we still don't know what it's doing, which is, and it could hold, like in this case, it could end up being a, a significant player, at least to understand these kinds of constraints on the wrinkly spreader more. Um, well, I was... Karen, go ahead. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I was just going to make a comment about how I think that this is a great way of studying uh, genes of unknown function, just like the two of you were saying. Because if you have a gene of unknown function then, and you have no idea how it's controlled or what sorts of proteins it interacts with, just by looking at the suppressor mutations, you would be able to identify uh, multiple facets of the things that are interacting with this gene. And, I mean, I'm working on a gene of unknown function. I have no idea what it does right now. Um, I don't have time to do this, but <laughs> it's a great idea. That's you are, you're working on one in Francis Ella? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I screened a transposon mutant library, and um, I identified specific genes that are responsible for um, invasion and replication. And, mm -hmm. in, and when I infect these mutants into mice, um, there's no disease. But, the, like, I've characterize it to the point where it's like, okay, it's involved in virulence, but that's all I know. I don't actually know what it specifically does. So I'd love to know what it specifically does, and maybe I could do that with the system, but unfortunately, I'm out of time. So. Yeah, you got to defend in December, right? Yes, I do. There's no time for that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Very cool. So it's gene of partially known function. Um, maybe. I'm, well, par <laughs> partially known in the sense that, um, yes, it contributes to virulence, but, I mean, that's, uh, you would need to find more. I mean, everybody does, okay, this is a virulence factor, and you follow the typical steps of doing the experiments that everybody else does, uh, mm -hmm. because you have to, but then at the end it's like, but what does it do? And it's like, well, <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah. I wish there was more. I just don't have time. That's how whole careers are built. What does this do? <laughs> 20 years later. Yeah. So uh, one of the other things that I thought was neat about this is they kind of go through, as I mentioned, all the different categories. So there's some of, of kind of the, what you, I think, would assume to be the usual suspects. So um, negative regulators, promoter mutations. So that makes sense. If you're looking at overproduction of cellulose, then um, addressing promoter, the control of a promoter, that makes sense. 
I thought the gene fusions were neat, even though there were, I think there were only three, but I thought that was really interesting. So it was, the idea behind this is that they saw with three loci, they saw multiple deletion mutations that essentially removed a segment of DNA and caused a fusion between um, one of the uh, diguanolate cyclase genes that they'd identified and an upstream gene. And they went on later in the paper, they actually looked at um, transcriptional expression with quantitative PCR. And I think that they did find that, perhaps not for all, but for uh, most, that gene fusion did in fact increase um, transcription. So yeah, they've got a part here that says, wrinkly spreader types carrying gene fusion mutations also showed large increases in transcription with 23 and 219 fold increases supporting promoter capture as the mechanism of activation, which I thought was kind of cool. No, this, this is very similar to some of the stuff that I'm teaching freshmen about the way that cancer can happen with some forms of uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Translocation between two chromosomes, the Philadelphia chromosome, uh, you have an oncogene, a proto-oncogene that's linked to an, a constitutive high promoter. There's a growth advantage to those cells. They're able to outcompete the others. Mm -hmm. So that's what I love is how protean genetics is. It's already protean in us, but microbes are incredibly plastic and protean. Yeah. That's, that's why they're the small masters. Come on. That's what it is. Yeah. And it, it's just, it's, it's variation, but coupled to those enormous population sizes. You know, that's, that's exactly the right way. When, when you figure out there are how many genes present in your, in your microbiome, I mean, it's an enormously large number, so anything that can happen, we'll see. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's very hard for, for people to kind of really confront inside. And that's yeah. exactly what we're it's, looking at here. It's you took the entire population of every human on the planet and found one person who carried one trait. That's essentially what you're doing every time you subject yeah. bacteria to selection. That's right. Yeah, that's true. It's fun to work on bacteria. Anyway, guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to run a little early, but I'm really glad I was able to join in. Yeah, we're glad to. Thank you very much for joining hopefully us. Hopefully I can make the next one. Yeah, okay. I hope so. All right. Have a great day. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, me too. Bye. Um, so thanks to Brian for joining us. Um, and I did want a, a follow-up here for the gene fusion thing is um, I was reading through the, dis the discussion, and, and as somebody who, as I've mentioned already, works on, has worked on reduced bacterial genomes, they've got one, like, toss-off sentence that made me go, what? <laughs> Where they said, um, the loss of genetic material through beneficial gene fusions could contribute to deletional bias over evolutionary time scales as observed in bacteria. So that's one thing that, that we, there's evidence for an underlying deletion bias in bacteria. Like under, under if you remove selective pressure, there's a parent, well, that's probably not a fair way to say it. But the, the idea is that, that if you're not selecting for the function of the gene, there is some other force that's leading to bacteria having a deletional bias from the genome rather than adding genes. And there's a lot, I think there's, it's still under, under debate what that selective pressure might be. Some people theorize that the longer it takes you to um, replicate the chromosome, but you have a, you're less fit. I don't, but that's debated too, whether or not that's an adequate explanation. Oh, yeah. Um, but so they toss that out, they say, you know, the loss of genetic material through beneficial gene fusions could contribute to deletional bias over evolutionary timescales as observed in bacteria and presents a selectionist alternative to reductive evolution by genetic drift for loss of biosynthetically expensive genes, which is precisely what you see in the symbionts with their reduced genomes. But most people, I, I believe, as I understand it, most people think of that as being an effect of like Mueller's ratchet, mm -hmm. where, um, where you have the effect, where you, the, the, the reduced genome is, by and large, thought to be the, uh, the result in the outcome of genetic drift. So they're suggesting, like, well, maybe some of these gene fusions, maybe there's a selectionist interpretation or a selectionist alternative theory to why you would have loss of DNA from these genomes, because then you, that is a way to do promoter capture and increase expression of a downstream gene. It's like, ooh. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> So, I mean, it was one sentence, but it caught me because that's something I've worked on before, is the idea of why do you get these reduced, these reduced genomes, so, very interesting. Um, yeah, so, I am kind of curious about what you guys thought in terms of the discussion. They, they are, 
setting up kind of the, the the ultimate outcome here is what they're attempting to do is is come up with a with a, a set of, of rules or a set of first principles given given certain constraints. So this is not this is applicable if you can meet certain parameters in your system. And then they're saying, okay, we want some of these rules to try to understand how um, evolution might occur. Um, and you can understand why this might be helpful because it, they, um, at least I think in the in the digests that Eli puts together, they kind of talk about evolutionary forecasting. So if you want to think about predicting the rise or the um, establishment of antibiotic resistance in a certain population, this could be a really helpful thing to think about. Um, and I just wasn't sure if you guys had any thoughts about, they really go big with their, with their discussion, so it's kind of hard to figure out where to kind of come in at it. But I don't know, did, was there anything in particular that struck you as you were reading the discussion? How, how much I wish Rich Lenski would, would kind of chime in on these thoughts. Because this is exactly kind of the things he's been looking at in other systems. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, all props to Paul Rainey, who I have the greatest respect for. Um, but Rich Lenski has done a lot more thinking than I'll ever do about this. Um, it's interesting to think about the, the plasticity of genomes and the availability of and that's why I brought up evolved beta-galactosidase. I mean, when you delete LAC-Z completely, uh, leave permease intact, so some gets, in, some gets into the cell, you'll find there are other glyco uh, glycosidic enzymes that with a couple of mutations can then break down lactose, then selection acts on those if that's the only selective agent. Um, I'm really interested in how often you get these things happening in the absence of selection. Mm -hmm. What it looks like from this paper is there are a broad variety of ways in which you can get to the um, most important phenotypic change, which is the production of all of the cellulose so that you make the mat. Mm. Um, and and I, I, I still maintain, and again, all due respect to the very serious scientists who work on this, there may be other changes taking place. You know, until you take a mutation and you use, say, a phage to do a direct replacement, I always worry about secondary mutations. I also worry about the fact that every single time we do anything with these microbes, we're Darwinowing them to sure. life under those conditions. I mean, the hand of Darwin is on every experiment we do. And it's easy to forget that. I, I know in grad school we were in a hurry to do a bunch of experiments, and I had a friend who was always with pick colonies as soon as he saw them from transformations, and he would use them for other transformations. And pretty soon he got an E. coli that had a whole bunch of colionic acid being produced. Mm. First things he was picking. So he was the selective agent. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. So um, I, I'm, I'm real curious about, you know, how you tell the origins and the products. Because it's like the moving river joke. You know, it's not the same river. Yeah. And, and so what I like about this paper is they remove the three known pathways. They showed that for the most part, you could recruit another signaling molecule pathway to interact with that. And this takes us to systems biology, mm -hmm. which is, I think, where all the complex phenotypes are going to be involved. And this is not a complex phenotype. This is just overproduction of cellulose. Mm -hmm. Although, um, I'll put up one more picture I'll send to you in a minute, Laura, of some other types. I, I already tweeted out some pictures that we got. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tweet out some other types of wrinkly spreaders that we got as well. Yeah. I'll put out the big one for you. So, so, so maybe, and I don't know what's different between, say, a moderate wrinkly spreader and an extreme one. Is that due to more um, recruitment or more effective recruitment, higher levels of RNA? Can't answer that question. Yeah. That's something Von Cooper's going to know all about. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I thought was interesting about this is because the, the phenotype that you're looking for is this wrinkly spreader, but, but that's kind of... That's a, a, a diagnostic visual thing to see it on an auger plate. But what you're really what you're really after is the idea that it's trying to colonize the air liquid interface. And I'm kind of curious, as you mentioned, like there's a lot that goes into that. So there's a, there could be some. I, for instance, I don't know how much there's like you mentioned cheaters earlier, and how much competition there is between. Um, the different you're getting, you're, you've got different genotypes, 
and they're all trying to colonize the air liquid interface and they all have a, a fitness advantage over you know certainly over the smooth morph but then what about over each other and how does all that work and and it could be that there's papers out there where they're looking at the population dynamics and I'm just well, not familiar with them but I think that's an interesting part of this too and, and I want to jump in for the people who really are experts in this field and as I say I'm not my understanding is if you want to see the cheater effect and the sinking mat you have to let it go on for quite a long quite a period while. of time yeah. And they're not doing that here. Yeah, right, because right. no, that's not what they're after. Right, and they are doing a lot of competition experiments, but again, within that context of, of you know, within the, the mat. Right, but and the competition experiments were were with reconstructed mutants, so they're yeah. doing, they're, it's, it's, um, it's kind of an artificial competition experiment. It's, it's, not, it's not the competition that you would get if you started with the ancestral genotype and then you looked to see what, what happened and which came to... Um, pro which genotype came to prominence and where, and is there stratification in the mat itself? I have no idea. Um, but that's well, all really interesting. And, and I, I, I hope that somebody throws away the original isolate of, of, of the, this strain. The strain and, that everybody's using? Yeah. Because, I mean, how many times has it, I mean, is, is it every time from the same frozen? I hope so. Mm. Because it may be accumulating things too. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's 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 you know sounds. You can, you can get yourself into the weeds really easy if you think about that too much. <laughs> well, um, I I once was at a conference. I can't. Um, I was at a talk, um, and his the guy's name was Brian Coombs. Um, he's actually at McMaster, and uh, my one of my grad student friends is there postdocing in his lab right now. But he was talking about how the when pathogens pass through your system, each there are many of the individual pathogens become clonal in of themselves and they have and accumulate different mutations that um, then by acting selection you can't really think of them as a population anymore because they're very much individuals. Oh, okay. and so I, I thought that was a really interesting concept like even as he was talking about it. So you're looking at modeling the early stages of speciation maybe. That's a little um, tricky with bacteria because you've got what's your bacterial definition of a species, but um, but the the like what they mentioned with this paper, just like the adaptive radiation, the idea of kind of are you getting differentiation into <clears throat> different subsets that are specializing in niches and so forth. Well, yeah. as a as another comment on the discussion, uh, I was thinking about like because this particular phenotype is about overproduction of cellulose, so then. Um, you would obviously have evolutionary pathways that would bias towards overproduction. So then the the fact that you find um, mutations in extrinsic negative regulators or intrinsic negative regulators or promoter activation is of the fact you want to make more of this one product. But if you if you were looking at a different phenotype or a different uh, trait, then the order of this uh, mutational rate would probably be different. It, you oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So because because you're trying to get you're trying you're essentially trying to increase expression in one right. way or another to get exactly. more cellulose. But right. you're suggesting like what if you needed less of a product or what right. if you needed a product with a totally different function mm -hmm. rather than just more of what you've already got. Yeah, that's a good point. So we yeah, find so. Yeah, ask these questions of a different system to get that's a really good point. Yeah. So I, I have a kind of, uh, um, as we're closing out here, I just have a quick question about the, the so we've got the smooth morph, we've got the wrinkly spreader morph, but then we've also got, which they don't really talk about, the fuzzy morph at the bottom. So what is it, if everybody starts from the same ancestral genotype, but you get fuzzy and you get wrinkly, like what is the, what is the fork, what is the evolutionary trajectory that leads the ancestral genotype to going one way or the other? Do you, do you know, Mark? I don't know. I do not. Um, it's it's if you go back to the original paper, they have a fate map that's worth your time. Oh yeah, you mentioned that. I should look at that. And I sent you a link to it. I, okay. I can email you the actual PDF if you'd rather. Sure. And and, I, and I, I would like I, I would like I don't know how often people look at this, but this is such a fabulous system for students. Yeah, it sounds like it. I would love, I mean, I would normally say let's all get together and come up with some, you know, things to do, but kind of Vaughn did that. Yeah. Vaughn, you, you, you kind of did that, and, and I have my own spin on things, but I don't want to take away anyone's thunder, but we should all try and put our own stamp on this 
and see what we can come up with because I think it's a great thing to teach them. Hardest concept for students is how variable it is. I mean, Karen talked about every time a microbe goes through you, there's a selection of agent going on. Heck, every time we grow them in a 2059 tube, there's a selective pressure that goes on there. Yeah. It's true. And, and I know that, gosh, Rich Lenski a long time ago had a student who was interested if you could find bacteria that were better able to survive cryofreezing based on 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 you know multiple selections and and I wouldn't be at all surprised sure yeah well there's probably some some I mean I use glycerol for my cryoprotectant some people use DMSO I wonder if that makes a difference I'm sure it does <laughs> Ah. But I, I totally think Laura's right in the sense if you spend too much time thinking about this, I'd be like, are we working on the right microbes at all? <laughs> You'll never get anything done. <laughs> You'll just be frozen, paralyzed from indecision about, what am I starting with? <laughs> I, I would argue that they're working on us. Yes, I think so. I think so. Okay, well, um, we're coming up to 3 o'clock, and so in the interest of kind of keeping this in, within our hour window, I think we'll, we'll close out, um, unless anyone's got anything really, they really want to say. I was going to say really riveting to say, but I don't have anything riveting, riveting to say. So. <laughs> can, can I make a recommendation? Absolutely. It, I would like to try and, and guilt Rich Lenski and Von Cooper into contributing to this after the, after the case. So because there's going to be a website that you put up, yeah. you, you know, let's see if we can get them to make some comments. Maybe they, maybe, he would, maybe they would prefer to do it privately to you, but I think this is a fabulous opportunity to get this information out there, that what yeah. a fun system, what a good system to look at for scientists, but also for students. Sure, definitely. And um, we'll certainly, um, I, I mean, I, we've got Vaughn up here on Twitter who says, uh, you know, he's got... Uh, He's favorited your evolving stem.org, so we've got confirmation from Vaughn that that's the right thing. Um, and we'll definitely point to that because that is a fantastic, that's fantastic that it's making its way into high school biology. Oh, yeah. The earlier you start to get these concepts across, that's just fantastic um, and very, very needed. Um, so that's great. Yeah, I will, um, I will be updating the page on our uh, website for the Journal Club generally. I'll update the page with some of the things that Mark has I've seen posted to Twitter. And um, I'll um, maybe we'll ping um, Vaughn and Rich on Twitter and see if they, if they have an opportunity um, to, to watch it and kind of offer some, some perspective. That would be fantastic. Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to misrepresent anything here. So I want, you know, the, the experts to really chime in. And let me take this opportunity, and I'm very sorry that I'm only doing this at the end. I should have thought of this so much sooner. It's the, it's the end of the semester fog that I'm in. Um, Matreya Dunham uh, is also doing work very much along these lines, trying to look at parallel um, evolution, trying to understand the constraints. And um, I, I tweeted to her and her lab to see if they might be able to join us, because I knew she was working in this area. And she wrote me back and pointed me to a preprint that is, is out from her lab that addresses similar things. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume it's in yeast because that's what she works on, but I, my brain is all over the place these days. Um, but I will post that as well because I've marked that on my to-read list because she's, um, I'm, I really like her work, and she's thinking about some of the same things. And I'm, I regret that I'm only now remembering to say that. So I'll add that too. And she's perhaps, really great. She's been really great on Twitter to me, so she sounds like a quality person. Oh, yeah, she's great, and maybe she'll have some thoughts, too, so I'll, um, I'll ping her as well um, with, with this on the page, and maybe she can add some of her perspective, too. So, all right, well, thanks very much to everybody. Um, I really enjoyed talking about this paper, and if people have comments, you can certainly tweet at us or leave a comment on the web page, and we will be um, um, in the works is the Summer of Symbiosis Book Club, which I floated really late one night, and Karen was like, you're not making any sense. I'm like, well, it will when I have more sleep. <laughs> um, but that's in the works. What I would like to do is uh, do maybe a symbiosis book club over the summer in the hopes that we've got maybe a little more time to read. And um, the, the, I've got a book that I would like to read called um, 1 Plus 1 Equals 1. Fabulous and book. Is it? Oh, good. It's on my shelf, and I want an excuse to read it. And, um, and, I, and if... Other folks have suggestions. I, I'm going to set up a page specifically for that. Oh, there, there it is. The symbiotic habit. Is that a good one? It's fabulous. Ah, all right. Well, then that we might add that on. 
So if you're if you're watching and that symbiosis is something that interests you, please keep an eye out for that, and um, we'll try to do that over the summer. It's a little selfish for me because I'm teaching symbiosis in the fall, so I'm going to try to like absorb everybody's knowledge before. <laughs> I'm going to be doing that with freshmen again. Would you like to be one of the people that I, I that like skypes in and and answers questions from freshmen? Sure, absolutely. I'd love to. Yeah. yeah. So watch for that summer of symbiosis coming your way. Summer. Um. Yeah, that's what I decided to call it, Karen. It's going to be great. Okay. So thanks everybody, and we we will see you next time. And um, feel free to uh, leave a comment on Twitter for us. Bye.